Michael Bakaich, thank you so much for joining me today. I uh, really appreciate your time. Uh, for the listeners, uh, this is Michael. He is the founder and the CEO of Iceberg Cyber. We have uh, quite a bit to discuss today on uh, pretty much everything cyber related. So, Mike, once again, thank you for coming on today. Thanks for having me, Michael. So to kick things off, why don't we give our listeners a little bit of an overview background about uh, what Iceberg Cyber uh, truly does. Great. Iceberg is a Toronto-based cybersecurity startup. We are pioneering the cyber version of a credit score for small businesses. Our main mission is to try and make cybersecurity simple enough that a small business owner, regardless of their tech background or how much tech savvy they have, can truly appreciate the cybersecurity risks of their business. We live in a new world where automation and AI have made it very profitable for cyber criminals to attack small businesses. And it's become the reality that a small business owner needs to have this on their plate, but it doesn't have to be complicated. And that's what we're trying to solve is making the conversation simple enough. Just like you use a credit score to track the financial health of your business, you can use your cyber score to practically track and appreciate the cyber risks to your business. I like that. And, and what was that tagline we were talking about with the, the cyber security score? What were you saying? The cyber version of a credit score for small business. That's the, the tagline. The cyber version of a credit score. Yeah, that, that's super that's cool. right. I, I mean, cybersecurity in general is has got to be one of the most important things any business you know needs to get into ASAP, right? It's one of the biggest risks any company faces. It's no longer your building burning down. It is a, a hack or something cyber uh, related as far as a threat, right? That's right. Practically speaking, all small businesses are engaged in cybersecurity, whether they know it or not, because we all enjoy the benefits of using computers and the internet and e-commerce to deliver value to our clients. We're having this call over Zoom right now. We wouldn't be able to do that if we weren't involved in cybersecurity. There's security to make sure that we can connect to Zoom safely, make sure this communication is encrypted, and we use those same tools to transact with our clients, speak to them, connect with them. So we're already engaged in cybersecurity. The, the real change in mindset that we're trying to promote is to think about it as a, as a tool that requires maintenance. It's not something that you can just use and forget about because if you wake up one morning and we can't have these Zoom calls, there's going to be some nuisance, inconvenience to operating your business. Worst case, you're starting to lose money because you can't call your clients. So that's the type of mindset and conversation we're trying to promote is we're already engaged as small business owners with cybersecurity. It's a component of our everyday operations. And we're trying to spread the word to show the practical maintenance tasks that you need to be engaged in so that you can keep the factory working properly. And I'm sure every time you sit with the prospect and you break down how many times they're interacting with something that needs some sort of cybersecurity, they're like, oh yeah, I do that and that, and that, and you really open their eyes to how uh, connected they are to things that need cybersecurity and your services and insurance and everything like that. Um, would you say it's a pretty big educational curve at first to highlight the threats and you know possibilities, and then they kind of come full circle to see that they need the, the coverage and services? Absolutely. Education is the core tenant of the value that we provide to clients. The scoring, the hardware product, the software, the stuff we do, those are all just ways that we help empower the business owner with information. Education is the main product we're pushing because the business owner knows their business the best. We're not experts on their business. We might be experts on computers and cybersecurity, but that's, that's beside the point. We want to be the partner so that a small business owner can have the information they need to make sure they're, they're secure. Just like you're filing your taxes or working with HR, these are things that the business owner appreciates at a, at a high enough level that they can execute it and lead their team. We want to be that same funnel so that the CEO of the company has the intel to make practical decisions about how to manage their risk so that they can continue the operation of their business. And it must seem certainly overwhelming at points because the business owner, like you said, they're an expert in their widget company, but they don't have a clue about cybersecurity or like everything that comes with it, right? So to see all the terms and the different diagnostics and reports, I'm sure that's overwhelming, but I, I, I'm assuming it's your job to somewhat simplify that as to here's your threats, ABC, let's fix these uh, and kind of work with the, whatever industry they're, they're in, right? A hundred percent. 
the IT cybersecurity business is populated by computer nerds. You're looking at one of them here, but not everyone's a computer nerd and nor should they be. Like you don't have to be an expert car mechanic to know if something's wrong with your car. You take it to the mechanic, they fix it, you get your car back. That's how you got to look at the computers. They're, they're machines. They're, they're not perpetual energy machines that run without maintenance. They all require maintenance. In some cases, the maintenance is regarding data privacy and security, but these are still like proactive hygiene tasks that you need to conduct to keep everything running securely. If you work with an IT company, they're like your car mechanic. They'll tell you what's wrong, what needs fixing, the passwords aren't working, you need a password manager, this computer's busted, you need to replace it. That's how you engage with it. And really, we're trying to fit in that piece of the puzzle to be the guiding light using our cyber scores as a ladder. It's your bill of health. We show you where you're lacking, where you need to invest. And that way you can use it as a communication tool with your IT company, with your own employees, and with your board, with the, with the business owner, so that they know where to best put the money, where to get bang for the buck, what they don't need to worry about. Yeah. So could you break down a little bit about the reports and um, kind of scoring system you have? Sure. Our cyber score is tailored completely to a small business owner. So there's no like three, four letter acronym from some U.S. government agency that states like these are the compliance regulations that you need to deal with. By the time you get to that level of IT maturity, there are other consulting companies and regulations that you'll that you'll worry about. We're trying to speak to the small business owner that's trying to go from zero out of 10 on the IT maturity scale to like four out of 10. That's our practical sweet spot. Yeah. If you're reusing the same password for all your accounts and and you don't think that the website is an important part of your risk surface, you you want to talk to us. That's the people we talk to the most, the ones that are at a zero or one on the scale. And for the listeners to know, that's like 80, 90% of the small business market because we talk to dental clinics, accountants, they're specialists in dental hygiene or accounting. They're not necessarily specialists in computers. So that's what we're trying to give them the practical information to take their first steps so that they can see some, they can see some bang for the buck and then make a reasonable improvement in the security. To do that, we cover four main areas of a small business's risk profile. The first one is email security. The, for a small business owner, email is where you should definitely put your chips on improving cybersecurity for your company because all your employees use emails to converse with each other or to clients. So you're passing back and forth private corporate information, HR information, financial client information, tons of stuff goes through our email accounts. And more importantly, they're the they're the primary target for a criminal to try and break into the company to either steal that client information or get into the computers to distribute ransomware or malware. So email security is a big component. In our, in our cyber score, we're looking for whether your email is set up with the proper security configurations to prevent people from sending you phishing emails or whether the email is configured properly to prevent a criminal from spoofing your email address. For example, if we didn't have these email, these spoofing email configurations set, someone could impersonate me and send emails to anyone looking like they came from my email address. Unfortunately, by default, Google and Microsoft don't configure these, which is why like 90% of companies don't have these configured. So it's a great, easy first step. It takes like five minutes to set up. Anyone can do it. And as an example, of one easy thing that we search for, feed it to you as part of your cyber score show you how to fix it, and boom, you just made an improvement in cybersecurity. This isn't uh, one of the more common ways that uh, kind of hackers get in is, is through employees, accidentally clicking on an email that looks real, that looks like it comes from the boss, everything looks real. Maybe there's one, it's an L instead of an I or an I instead of an L, so it looks like the exact same email, and then that's how the kind of threat happens, right? Exactly. The gross majority of incidences happen with email as the first point of contact between the adversary and the business. And this is just the nature of the fact that we're using emails all the time. Anyone can send you an email. There's no like gating to prevent a criminal from sending you an email. And there are AI and automation tools that can send millions of emails per day. So it's, a, it's an easy spray and pray technique that adversaries use. 
everyone gets spam emails. Everyone gets phishing emails. I get phishing emails all the time. And I mark them as phishing in our account. We delete them. We block from the sender. These are all the things that you have to do to make sure that your employees are safe because my, like my employees are getting phishing emails as well. So I see them in our portal. They're Sometimes they impersonate me. They can't spoof our email address, but they'll just put my name as the sender name. There's nothing we can do about that. And it'll say, Michael Bukai just emailed employee number two. Hey, employee number two, it's Mike. I need your telephone number and I need you to send me that whatever, whatever. Or, hey, it's Mike. I need you to open this form and fill it out. These are just easy, low-hanging fruit to try and trick employees into clicking something they shouldn't. The employee is without a doubt the most valuable part of this chain. They're the, the biggest opportunity for success and the biggest opportunity for failure because they're just like we're talking about business owners being preoccupied. The employees are doing their jobs. Their number one job is not cybersecurity. It's to do whatever their role is. And the adversaries are trying to prey on that, find them at a moment when they're busy, not thinking about this, and they accidentally click on a link. It happens all the time. There's no shame in it. And that's why it's it's such a high frequency attempt because it is so easy to execute. And even one in a million success rate is still a lot of money that can be stolen. And, and you said there's uh, four things you guys measure. That was right. one, so of, the, one e of the four. Email yeah. is number one. And it's the yeah. most successful when we talk to business owner because everyone knows about email. So getting your email credentials stolen is very accessible. They're for sale on the dark web. We can show you. We can show you what your old passwords were that were stolen. It's a great way to make that first connection. So practically, this is what you got to focus on. Second big component is website security. Almost every business has a website. That's the reality of the game now. You use the website as your digital persona. That's how your clients and prospective clients see you. That's how they find the, your phone number and your address. They, they book meetings through the website. They may even transact business with an e-commerce platform on your website. It's a big component of your operation and therefore a big component of risk. And so we do the same thing. We're looking for risk indicators in the back end of the website, in the HTML code and how the website is operated. We use automated software to work through the website, trying to find vulnerabilities and present that to the business owner with the same instructions. Here's the issue. Here's how it's explained in plain language. So you know what, what this is about. No high tech jargon required. And this is how you fix it. Most cases, you fix it by just going into the website admin portal and pressing update package or something. Updating the software firmware is the easiest way to stay secure. And so our job is really to automatically search for that and then feed the business owner the information. Okay. Number three. Third, third one is now where we get into network security, a little bit more technical. We're, we're on the network right now. We're on the internet. Welcome. We're connecting from <laughs> yeah. where I am in Toronto to where are you also in Toronto? So the, the, the business, your, your brick and mortar office is going to have some connection to the internet. Your employees are working through the internet, talking to clients, doing whatever. We, will use our tools to scan from our security servers down to the office and look for any vulnerabilities that could allow an unauthorized adversary to break into your network connection. Because once they do, they have access to all the private data, client information, financial information, what it may be on your network. So we're looking for, in the, in the analogy we use, we're looking for the open windows and doors to try and break into the office, but in the digital space, not in the physical space. The fourth component is the internal version of that. So their network security is like looking from the outside, trying to get in. Our local office security is inside looking around. We provide the client with this little palm-sized computer, plug and play device, just like you get from your internet service provider, you throw it into the network, plug it into the router. It automatically detects all of the laptops, computers, smartphones, VoIP phones, servers that you have at the office. We'll create an asset inventory so you can meaningfully track all the digital assets you have. And then we do detailed risk profiles, looking for passwords that are insecure, out-of-date software, issues that can be exploited, ways that adversaries can steal client information or money from you. And with those four components, now we can give you a rather holistic view, email, website, external and internal risk, try and give you a, a practical view at the 360 security risks that impact your business. 
And I'm sure once you kind of explain your process and everything you do, probably one of the most frustrating things you might hear is that it won't happen to me or it can't happen <laughs> to me or somehow they're immune uh, to a hack, yeah. even though if you, you know, rhymed off a list of all the major companies that have been hacked, it's everything from like Home Depot to Ikea to the government. So I'm pretty sure any mom and pop shop uh, has equal, if not greater risk. It's an, it's an unfortunate reality that the it won't happen to me is not true anymore. Ten years ago, that was true enough because small businesses were, were too cumbersome to be targets for an adversary. But the world that we live in now with so the software automation that exists makes it highly profitable to just target small businesses at scale. We, I know this because we use the same software. We're using the same software that hackers are using. We're just not exploiting people. We're finding their weaknesses and presenting it to them in this private dialogue so that we can help the business improve their security so someone else can't come around and find the same flaws. That's, but we, that's, we, yeah, go ahead, Mike. Oh, I was going to say, that's pretty interesting that you use the same stuff that hackers use. Exactly. You're, you're I mean, that, really that's the best way to find the weakness is to use the same tools the criminals will use because that's the weakness that they would find. Our job is just to get there first and help the business owner patch this hole before someone else finds it and walks through. Is this software something that the hackers invented first and are using or the, the good guys invented it first and the hackers used it in a negative way or a little bit of both? It's a little bit of both. It's, it's like looking at a baseball bat and seeing it either as a deadly weapon or a tool for playing sports. You know, right. these, are, these are computer tools. There, they were invents. Most of them were invented without malicious intent. Many have malicious intent because there's good money in being a criminal. Unfortunately, you can make a ton of money. Sooner or later, the RCMP or the FBI is going to catch up with you. But that's the the temporal motivation that that has given rise to all this cyber crime. And the cost of of having a cyber hack or attack happen to you is extraordinarily high, far higher than anybody would imagine. The length of time it takes to fix a problem is extraordinarily longer than most people would ever imagine. So a business could literally be shut down with, with one attack if it doesn't have the right stuff in place or the ability to get up and running uh, pretty quickly after. No doubt the news does a great job at highlighting those high-end cases where Large companies, Sobe had an incident several months ago. Practically speaking, for a small business owner, those news articles feed the it won't happen to me type mindset because they think, well, I, I just run a small accounting firm. I'm not a grocery store. No one's coming after me. The better statistic to talk about are last year, the Business Development Bank of Canada released a survey of small business owners, less than 100 employees. So small, small business owners. One in five of them had experienced some incident with the average damages being 50 grand. That's a much more practical and, but still devastating statistic. That means every five years is going to happen to you. So the, it won't happen to me. That's an, that's an outdated mindset is, is going to happen to you. These were Canadian small businesses with less than hundred employees. That's, that's 94% of the Canadian economy. And one in five of them, had a cyber incident crossing 50 grand. So if, and, if you think, if you had the, the cash laying around to go offline for like four weeks because you had to rebuild your computer network or, or like rebuild all your computers and pay 50 grand and handle the damages of, of your reputation to your clients, then you can say it won't happen to me. But if the, like practically speaking, if you don't have 50,000 bucks lying around in cash to pay for ransomware or if you can't go offline for four weeks and then tell your clients, I lost all of your private information, would you like yeah. to still do business with me? Then this is a problem that you should think about because that's the more practical consequence is that you're going to end up in small claims court because you lost all of the credit card information or you lost all the private information. If you're an accountant, it's, it gets juicy. You lost all the financial records for all your clients. Now go tell a new client that you want to prospect them and add them to your portfolio. They're yeah. going to say, what did you do differently from before? 
what did you do differently from before? Because before you were operating in the it won't happen to me mindset. So what's new? Because otherwise they're going to say, no, thank you. I'll go to an accountant that takes my personal privacy privacy seriously. Yeah. Yeah. That's a conversation I don't think anyone wants to have is not only do you still want to be a client after this hack, but please don't sue me uh, because all your right. information is, is out there, right? And, and this is the area that we've been pursuing because because a big component of the education is working through this, it won't happen to me philosophy. So we've been talking to lawyers that work with small businesses and that's where that's where this messaging is coming from. I spoke to the lawyers, I said like, BDC says this happens to one in five people. So where are they? Where's where's the two hundred thousand small businesses? Because you don't see them in the news. Mm -hmm. Where where are two hundred thousand small businesses happening? And the lawyers that we interviewed said, yeah, they they keep it quiet because it's embarrassing. I appreciate that. It's embarrassing. Let's make sure it doesn't happen. And those people end up in small claims court because they lost all the employees' social insurance numbers. Okay, beautiful. Canadian Privacy Act says take that to small claims court. The employees will come after you for negligence. Okay, there's tons of legal precedent for that. You don't want that to happen. Or you're an accountant, you lose all of the financial records of your clients. If you, if you le left them in a, in a, as a piece of paper in your filing cabinet, and someone broke in and stole the piece of paper, it'd be the same issue. Mm -hmm. It's just easier to walk away with 10 million files in a thumb drive or pull them out of your email inbox than it is to steal a filing cabinet. And I wonder out of the, that 200,000 people that you know got hacked, how many of them not only, well, they probably didn't have any services even close to what you offer, but also how many of them even had cyber insurance at all. And it's it's guaranteed it's not the full amount. It's probably, a, right. unfortunately, a lot smaller, a lot less than uh, than it should be. But the cyber insurance, the, these policies cover so much more than I think anyone would, would think or imagine. Um, they're not expensive and they, if something happens, you it really is like a truly holistic coverage to help you pay for all your expenses even if it's legal courts things like that get up and running hire people to track down what happened hire people to rebuild systems programs like it is a very robust uh style of coverage mm -hmm. yeah but, at uh, bare minimum what we want to try and promote to the listeners is that there's a certain duty of care that you need to exercise no one wants to be negligent in any component of their business because that doesn't sit well with your clients. You want to show them that you're exercising duty of care to deliver them great value, to protect the private information they entrust you with, and to make sure that you'll maintain operations so you can keep delivering the value to them, which is a big consequence of any cyber instance. Like you, you go offline for weeks. The, the customers still need the service that you provide. They can't handle when you go offline. So right. there's, there's a certain level of trust and Having cyber insurance, having some basic cyber hygiene, this is these are all ways that you exercise baseline duty of care. And the fact that like cyber insurance obviously isn't the law, no one makes you get it. But in a lot of industries, like for me, example, I have to have an errors and emissions insurance policy. So if some, I make a mistake, something happens, I have millions of dollars to, to cover me and more importantly, cover the client. It's funny because cyber isn't mandatory and Whenever there's an insurance that isn't mandatory, a lot of people just don't get it, even though they know they need it. Life insurance isn't mandatory, but so many people need it, but a lot of people still don't get it. It's almost like if if there was at least a minimum, like a commercial general liability, typically it's like one or two million, the minimum. And that's what people say is like if someone slips and falls in, on your property. And yes, right. that does happen. Someone slips on water and you know hurts their leg or something. But I would imagine that probably happens far less than all these recent cyber hacks. So it's almost like if there was a base coverage, um, even a million or something like that, it is a very inexpensive mm -hmm. type of insurance. Because no one's maliciously going and slipping on your sidewalk. You know, right. no one's walking into your business and maliciously slipping. I say no one, maybe some people try that, but yeah. that is a big difference to being a victim of cybercrime. You're a victim of criminal activity, but unfortunately there's no there's no government purse to reimburse victims. Like that's on the business owner. You're a victim of, of criminal activity. You still need to get back online and maintain the operations of your business. Yeah. And uh, one thing that the cyber insurance does cover as well, and a lot of business owners don't realize this, is it'll, it will help uh, like um, business uh, interruption uh, uh, coverage. So whatever like your revenues are, it'll keep your revenues or your profits level depending on the type of coverage you have so if your business does close down for a month or two months you still have some money coming in the door 
it also mm -hmm. can cover that, right? So it's not just the cost of maybe hiring some private investigators to kind of look into it and figure out what happened and dealing with some legal things. It is also keeping you afloat to stay in operation. So once the problem is solved, you know, it's almost, it's as if as close as it can get to it not happening, even though it did happen. Yeah. There's still, there's, there's always going to be pain and inconvenience. They, yeah. It's it's an unfortunate reality of the world that we're trying to operate in now. The, the I mean the plus side is we we shouldn't be all doom and gloom. The plus side is there are there are a ton of options out there for solutions. So the cyber insurance market has has ebbed and flowed over the last several years. It, like I'm I'm not the the full expert on the history of insurance, but I would wager that it has been the fastest development of any insurance line because it went from like no one having cyber insurance. To now we're talking about small businesses trying to get cyber insurance in a 10 year span, because that has been the rate of development for criminal activity targeting small businesses. And it has become this reality, which is demanding solutions to support the business owners. And to be honest, it's not that easy to get. Unfortunately, I wish it was a little easier, but it's almost a bit of a privilege to get. So you really should try and get it because a lot of people want it and they can't get it. And mm -hmm. services like what you offer helps people or can certainly help the client or prospect get the cyber insurance they need because on the applications, there's a lot of questions that are complicated and a lot of them relate to the things that you do. So if they're using your services, 100% it makes it easier for them to make the application to say, hey, listen, I'm using Iceberg Cyber and you know they're doing all these things. And the insurance company is like, okay, this company is taking it seriously. They have a lot more things, um, you know, kind of being proactive about it, better chance we're going to give them an offer for the cyber insurance. That's right. That, that's our mantra. We're trying to be proactive. We're proactive to reach out to the business owner. We're trying to get them to be proactive, to get in front of this. These are risks, just like installing the sprinklers and fire extinguishers. These are risks that your business has to deal with. Okay. If you be proactive, it's going to be way less pain and way less money than being reactive when you have an incident. And that's where we're trying to fit in. The, the, the cyber scoring service is cheap. 100 bucks a month. We're giving you the intel to keep track of the risks that are impacting you. We're giving you the free tutorials to show you how to do it yourself to improve. We'll help you improve too. We love it when the clients come back to us and say, Mike, I need help with this. I'm trying to do this thing. Yeah, sure. Okay, take five minutes. Let me jump on the call with you. Take five minutes. Here, I'll help you. Now your, your score just got boosted. You're in a better stance. I want you to be improved. And when, when you do that level of constructive hygiene, we've mapped the scoring to the insurance applications to make your life easier and to make the broker and the provider's lives easier because the insurance provider wants to sell you the policy. That's their business. They want to sell you the policy. They want you to not have a claim. So everyone's invested in, in you having a great experience. No one wants you to have a claim because everyone loses when that happens. No one wants you to have a claim denied. Everyone loses when that happens too. And unfortunately, the insurance application requires some intimate knowledge about computers because you have to attest that the security systems that the insurance provider is looking for are properly functional. And so we're helping with that too, to, to try and map those requirements to the common lexicon to our cyber score so that the business owner can see this in plain language. No one wants them to fill out the form inappropriately. No one wants their dynamic to change. You know, six months from now, if the, if the company changes, they have more employees, they don't want to avoid the policy because this, these are natural parts of the operation. Everyone wants them to succeed. And so that, that's the grout that we're trying to be that grout between the bricks, keep everyone on the same common language, make sure we understand what the requirements are, how to stay on the level. And that way the business owner can keep focusing on the business and not have to worry about being surprised. Yeah. It's not uncommon that most people don't want to pay for insurance, but everybody wants the insurance when something happens, right? Right. It, it, it's it's As you always say, that. You know, like, no, no one wants to pay for anything. Yeah. Like we're trying to sell security. No one wants to pay for that, especially when you're talking about this won't happen to me mentality. Okay, no problem. Let me talk you through it. I'm, I'm not smashing your window and then trying to sell you more glass. I'm, I'm trying to educate you. If I can educate you, you can appreciate the risk to yourself. Judge the value of the product. If it's not for you, if you really think it's not worth it, no problem. Join, join the one in five masses. It's okay. Yeah. Call your insurance provider in one to five years. Yeah, it's, it's true, right? Go talk to the person who did have the hack. Go ask yeah. them how much it cost and ask them if they wish they could have had insurance in the first place and see what they say.
right? Uh, Mike, uh, anything else you'd uh, like to add before we uh, wrap up today? Okay, my, my usual, my three takeaways for any listeners when it comes to, to cyber hygiene, that's how we like to talk about it. You know, cyber hygiene, cyber security, that might be for the big banks in Fort Knox, but practically speaking, we're talking about cyber hygiene. Just like brushing your teeth and flossing, it doesn't make any difference from one day to the next, but if you stay on top of it, five years from now, you're still going to have good teeth. Yeah. So number one cyber hygiene tip is to use a password manager. If the listeners take only one thing away from this, I'd rather it be for them to use a password manager. Password managers are very convenient. They'll make your life easier. You'll never have to remember passwords again. You just really need the one password to open the password manager. That The best benefit of this is it allows you to have random and unique passwords for all of your accounts. So when you log into Microsoft Outlook or Google and Facebook and your bank, these are all different 24 character long randomized passwords. The, the reason to do this is that these third-party services, they have data breaches all the time, at least once a week. There's nothing that, that you can do to prevent that. They're going to lose your email and password combo at some point. It's reality. If you reuse the same password, like with our clinics, they use Smile a lot. I say it, they use Smile a lot. If you're reusing Smile as your password for your bank, your Facebook, your email account, your accounting software, someone's going to find that on the dark web and just automatically try and log in. And the software allows them to do millions per day. So you're going to be one of those. So the number one rule is use a password manager. If you're with Google, Google's got a password manager for free. If you're with Microsoft, Microsoft Authenticator, free password manager, use it. The browsers have a password manager. iOS has a password manager. Everyone's got them now. They all have their differences, but using any of them is better than not using one. So just use one of them. Point number two is keep your computers up to date. Apple, Microsoft, Android for the phones, they all have dedicated security teams trying to keep your product secure. It requires your involvement. You got to go apply the updates, restart the device. The easiest way to do this is just like, this is how we do it. Each employee has got a little calendar reminder Friday afternoon before they check out for the weekend, go into the Windows update settings, check for updates, turn the computer off. Because when you when you power cycle the computer, it installs the updates. That's it. Everyone does that at 4.30 o'clock, 4.30 p.m. on Fridays. Yeah. That's that's how we stay on the level for that. And the third one is back hitting back to that spoofing settings with the emails. This one is a little bit more techy to talk about, but if you don't have these anti-spoofing settings configured, someone can impersonate you and send emails to random people or to your clients impersonating you. It takes five minutes to set up. You can come check out the tutorials on the website. If you work with an IT company, they can set up. The reason I include this on the, on the top three list is we've scanned millions of small businesses in North America with our cyber scores. 90% of them don't have it set up. 90% of them don't have it set up. So like I, I, I squawk this all the time because it is a big risk. And it's so easy. It's, it's, it's not going to cost you nothing. Five minutes of time, log into Microsoft Outlook, go to these settings, save, you're good. So that's, that's point three. Password manager, update the computers, do the anti-spoofing settings, more information, come to the website, thecyberscore.com, which we're trying to get you empowered with the information you need. You'll find it at thecyberscore.com. That's awesome, Mike. I appreciate it. Thanks for coming on today buddy. And, uh, we'll talk to you soon. My pleasure, Mike. Thanks for having me.